To think about where we've been and where we're going is a quite a massive undertaking to summarize that. So thinking that through, you know what, it makes me think of um, uh, James K.A. Smith, who's, uh, in my opinion, a brilliant uh, philosopher, Christian philosopher, uh, based in the States, educator. But he talks about the understanding of, uh, through, through a Hebraic lens, through the Hebrew language, that the word for remembering is to actually remember forward. And so he says the, the challenge is to um, not reach for nostalgia, because that'll just, that'll just dry, that just kills everything. Nor is it, though, just to reach for the novel. So he says between nostalgia and novelty is kind of this center lane, kind of this spot. And, you know, in the vineyard terminology, we've said this for years, like we, we like to discover where the radical middle is, sort of that place of tension and yet of life and vibrancy. So when I think about that in regards to the journey of worship, it's kind of, yeah, it's weird. You, you, you look back and you don't want to just be grabbing threads, nostalgic threads, to sort of recreate some feeling or some sentiment. Um, yet at the same time, you don't want to just do novel for the sake of novelty, new just for the sake of new. It's discovering maybe a better word, what is fresh. Or maybe a deeper thought is authentic. And I think for the vineyard journey, past, present, future, I think authenticity is what we're really after. Um, that's why intimacy is important to us. That's why local churches writing their own songs is important to us. That's why lament is important to us. That's why the whole sort of facet of giving articulation and expression, not just through music and lyric, but also through painting, through motion, through film, through, you know, the widest expression possible that gives sort of wings, you know, to the human heart to be able to express itself in the most authentic way. So when we think about Jesus, spirit, and truth, I was kind of raised in a tradition where my framing of worship for such a long time was that that was emotion and doctrine or or you know giving some feeling to really good deep theology but my understanding now is I've sort of lived through some things but also just a little more I think um, a little more integrity with the text is the language that Jesus is pulling there is from this place of the depth you know the psalmist would say deep calls unto deep so there's that place of spirit the new moss, the, the place of breathing and of life, that, in my understanding, is quite crippled, if not totally dormant or even dead, some of the biblical text says, outside of Christ. So what is that in me that's been awakened by Jesus? Because in any shaping, any expression of the heart, particularly through the arts, Lots, all of humanity can touch some really deep, resonant places. So is there something unique about worship? Is there something unique about that place of spirit? I think perhaps there is. So it's not, it's not dualism. It's not that something's spiritual and something that's sacred. But entertainment and worship are different because worship draws from that place, that place of spirit. But then Jesus immediately links it to truth, which is, um, yeah, I think uh, if I, I, I was listening to Suhail, you know, unpack some things, um, truth there is, is nothing hidden. It's not knowledge, it's actual authenticity. So what's the authentic gut of someone who's been redeemed by Jesus? Like what, what is that place, deep place of, of resonance? And I think that's been something that's always marked the vineyard community. So you have this little group of people huddled down in a house in Southern California in the late 70s, and they're burned out. 
I mean, no story is a new story in some ways, right? So all the deconstruct that's going on, all the disillusionment with church, all the stuff. I mean, these these things roll around over and over and over through the human story and just even in our modern history. So you have this little group, you know, uh, Carol Wimber, someone named Carl Tuttle. I think someone named Cindy Rethmeyer was there. Those of you that have been around for a while will recognize some of those names, and um, they're literally just in a little house, you know, and and just burned out on everything. And they're leaning into one of the Psalms. I think it's Psalm 42. And just the heart cry, when can we go and meet with God? Like, when can we just do that? Like, forget everything else. Like, is is that something that's actually attainable or something that we can actually pull off together? And that's where a lot of, the songs started coming forward, not so much, um, yeah, to sit down and write some songs so we have some things for our lyrics or whatever, but it was literally out of this deep, deep heart cry. So this this um, commitment to authenticity uh, at the time when Vineyard Worship was kind of finding its footing and, and uh, an expression that we realized without marketing or there was no big strategy. It's just all of a sudden the songs are going everywhere and people are, are singing them because I think it, it did have that sense of authenticity. So it was a combination of just being true and, and real. So it wasn't nest. The goal wasn't cultural relevance. The goal was authenticity. And because we were part of a certain culture we didn't like to wear suits and ties because guitars were kind of cool. And, you know, this the simplicity of, of you know, just some courting and, and a little more of a, for lack of a better term, a rock and roll format of giving expression to music. That it that happened because it was authentic, not because we're tr- we were trying to be relevant, if that kind of makes sense. So I think the desire for cultural relevance if it's not anchored to just being authentic, all of a sudden now you are held hostage by commercialism, you're held hostage by pop culture, you're held hostage by what's driving the charts, you're held hostage by all sorts of things that can suck away that that place of authenticity. So I think that's the deepest sort of true north for us in, in, in our vineyard worship understanding. And it's been really challenging to navigate the pressures um, because of some really great things, Uh, media, um, worship all of a sudden now actually has a career track. Um, I'm not super old. I mean, I'm getting older, but (laughs) it's like, you know, when we were stepping into this stuff, I mean, it wasn't, it, nobody was having the conversation. Could I actually have a career track or a vocation as someone that would be a worship leader in, in a church? Um, but that's, a, that's different today. So it's different bad, not necessarily, but it, but it requires uh, sort of a new, a recalibration of where, it, where is your compass set? How are you going to navigate these waters where you can make a hang a lot of a money, uh, but m- amount of money through pub- the published worship songs. Is that bad? No. Is it wrong? No. But it requires new questions. You know, how do, how do we carry this thing? Um, should we be charging like exorbitant amounts for a ticket to come to a worship event? Again, it's not, it's not a collision of of sacred and secular, it's it's not dualistic. But what what is the end game? So if we're calling people to come together, as back to our just that original little group in the in that house, when can we go and meet with God? That's a different in- invitation than, man, we're going to entertain your faces off and we're we're going to give you the best show you've ever seen. I love doing that kind of stuff. I've got these zebra docks that I bought in Frankfurt, Germany, quite a few years ago. And I can, uh, I have this little handle, Dr. Schlaven. And I love DJing. And I have no, there's, there's no, there's no dissonance in who I am when I step into that space and I paid a good little chunk of money 
to spin and to just kind of weave some some stuff together and just have a dance off. Like it's like, I love that. It's vibrant. It's life giving. But that's not a worship event. That like it's a different end game. Um, so when I come into the worship space, whether I'm speaking or facilitating liturgy or 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 um, curating some music, whatever that all looks like, it's different. It's not right or wrong, but it's different. And I think where we're wanting to go um, as, as a vineyard family into the future is going, how in a fresh way do we carry forward this, this desire for authenticity as we encounter God and as we encounter each other? Because there's no, there's no authenticity if our relationships are fractured. Um, Jesus says, you know, if you're on your way to bring a sacrifice in the place of worship and there's anything you can do to break a broken relationship, he's kind of like, you know what? Just put your gift down, leave the altar, and go make that thing right. <clears throat> your greatest act of worship in that moment is to go make things right with a brother or a sister, not sing a song. Uh, the crazy thing in the text is, is that in that particular story, the the inference is that it would be probably like several mile journey walking to go make that thing right as you've left your gift at the altar here. So it's not even just turning around in a worship service and going, hey, brother, I'm really sorry. You know, you give a hug and then you start singing again. It's this, there's, there's, there's intentionality, there's actual, but that is as much authentic, authenticity in worship as the expression of the song. So I think we're trying to find all those all, all those threads together in in an era where things have got a little complicated or or it's it's again for someone to step into the space and create you know a massive palette of creative expression when that's authentic like let it be so for example i love lighting i think it's i think it's can be one of the most evocative things to allow people to um, engage in worship. So pull it, pull it out of the entertainment sphere in, into the worship space. But if the lighting can accentuate what people are experiencing lyrically and musically, and it, it creates a deeper sense of an encounter with God without manipulating the experience, that's wonderful. But if the lighting and stuff is used to accentuate the worship leader or the band, or that sort of a thing, in that particular context, I'm not sure that's right. So it's not, it's not throwing certain things out and keeping certain things. So even simplicity isn't necessarily just stripping everything away. It's bringing it back to the core essence of, of what it is. Just coming down to that authenticity, I think, is like uh, really critical.